welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people. Uh, we've done nearly 700 of them now. If this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, uh, go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu, where you'll find them all organized in several different ways. This program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to help support it, there are PayPal buttons on the website, and there's a page which explains some alternatives to PayPal. My guest today is Emily Kastotter. Emily is in Sweden, and uh, she has written a book called All the King's Horses, which I read in its entirety and found quite fascinating. Um, Emily has been working since 1995 full-time with empathic communication with other species, non-hierarchical riding and handling of horses, alternative treatments such as acupuncture, homeopathy, and herbal medicine. She's published three books on these subjects. She runs a school mainly with horses and other species for empathic interbeing. This school is a farm that is a sanctuary for about 170 animals of different species, not to mention plants and surrounding nature. And most of those animals would have been euthanized if they hadn't ended up at Emily's school and farm. Um, and as we go along here, some of you might be thinking, well, how is this relevant to the usual bat gap theme? <laughs> but as we go along, I think you're going to see that it's very relevant. And my impression of Emily in reading her book is that she kind of has a foot in a couple of different dimensions. She's She really is an inter, interdimensional person. And we'll, you'll see what we mean by that, again, as we go along. Um, and not only dimensions of consciousness, such as, you know, deep communicative abilities with animals and some other people, but also dimensions of time. Because there's a whole theme in her book which keeps popping up about her dipping into the memories of some young girl who lived a long time ago. And I found that interesting. Um, but maybe a good place to start, Emily, is, well, first of all, if you want to add to anything I just said, you can do that. But then I, I also want to ask, like, how did this all first start for you? How did you first start talking with animals? Uh, and what is it like to live with this ability? Well, for me, it's it started spontaneously as a kid. Um, I grew up in a, what I don't know how to use the right phrase here, but um, quite a destructive family situation. So, uh, so I tried to stay away from home as much as possible and ended up in a stable, a riding school stable. And I lived in a in a city, so the stable and the horses were were in the outskirts of the city, which was not a very good environment for horses. They were tied up in stalls. Uh, they were all the time in, in an indoor arena, basically being forced to, to do what people told them to do. And, and the riding lessons that you could get there was also about making the animals do as you told them, as it often is, even today. Um, and you, when horses came to this this riding school, they would they would gradually break down uh, from this this all these limitations uh, and become uh, dull, apathetic, uh, and go lame or whatever. And then one day there was a, a pony, a small red chestnut pony, coming to this place, and she was so aggressive. And no matter what people try to do to her. To make her, as they said, respect people, and it's it's interesting how we we choose the, uh, to use the term respect uh, by hitting her and making her frightened, uh, and and she refused. She was just constantly fighting back. Um, and if they tried to give her sweets or treats or whatever, she would just bite people and not take it. And she had this, uh, what I can see now, a very very healthy sense of integrity. Uh, which she wasn't supposed to have because she was a horse, right? So she she wouldn't have a voice anyway. 
And something in her unbreakable spirit really fascinated me. And it terrified me too, because I didn't know how to reach out to her. I could see that if you got close to her, she would bite and kick. And, and I was afraid of that. So I was standing outside of her stable. And uh, and when I was standing outside of her stable, um, just looking at her in, in a sense of curiosity, I guess I was, I've been thinking about this over and over, trying to what actually happened that day. I think what pulled me to her was was a longing, um, a longing outside of, I was 11 years old, I wouldn't be able to phrase it, but a longing to get out of my isolation of only being able to experience the world from my own perspective, um, basically being locked up inside of my own emotions. There is a horse here that once explained that emotions is something we experience inside. Compassion is something we experience in the opening between individuals. So for as long as we are locked in, we, we are also overwhelmed by all sorts of things. And I guess I had an underlying yearning to get out of that state. Um, and uh, I looked at this pony and she looked at me. Um, and I would say that the way we define ourselves would be through through a knowledge of identity. I know my name. I know what I'm good at. I know where I was born. And all of that becomes true because I keep repeating it. Like I keep weaving this web that becomes the story of myself and it becomes my only reality. And in a way, a kind of sanity because I know where I begin and end and when the other one begin and end. But in this meeting, for reasons I will probably never know, uh, this uh, this difference, this uh, and, and <laughs> this wall, this invisible wall between us was, was taken off. And we ended up in the same sense of, uh, of self or the same. I didn't believe that I was her. Um, I, I knew that I was Emily, but we were sharing the same consciousness in, in that moment, which meant that I felt what she felt immediately. There was no time difference. Because in, in a conversation like we are having now, I will have to explain what I feel inside of me because you wouldn't know that. So I have to, to find it, express it and send it over to you. And hopefully you, you will be able to receive it and then you will do the same. But we still have this gap between us. And it was like this gap was taken away. So what she felt, sensed, all of that would become one full experience that I would share in the moment it happened to her, which means that she would also share exactly what I felt and experienced inside of, of her being. Uh, so you could say that we, we become each other, but we don't lose ourselves. I, th I think when I've been thinking about it later, I think it is an expansion of the self so that the idea of the self is no longer limited to only hold me as a concept. So in that way, you couldn't really call it a conversation, I guess. It's not telepathy to me, because telepathy would be the same thing as talking, but with thoughts. But we are not tossing anything across this gap anymore. We are totally sharing it. So something happens with the concept of time. Remember and Star Trek? They had the concept of mind melding in, yeah. <laughs> in Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, they were onto something, right? Yeah. Uh, so... Uh, when I experienced this with her, I felt this very almost bottomless feeling of powerlessness because no matter how high she would scream, nobody would ever hear her. Uh, and, and that sense of, of, of being isolated, um, that you really can't reach the outside world because you're an object. When you're a horse, you're not an equal. You're not a, uh, you're not valued as an as an equal living being. You're you're an object. You're you're a riding school horse. You're supposed to deliver something, and and if you can't deliver, you're you're being switched to someone else. There is no real value uh, in in your essence of being, and and the sadness in that was, was almost unbearable, and it, it scared me, and and that sense of 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 shame and and low self confidence was also inside of me. So as the door opened to see her, I could also no longer escape from facing myself. So to me, it was like a swinging door that goes both ways. Uh, you can't meet someone else unless you are totally open to be seen yourself. You can't hide behind something. 
uh, you, you cannot change, you cannot control what comes out because you, you, it's your entire being that goes into that meeting. Interesting. Yeah. And, and, and after that, uh, reality never really became normal again. It was like this, this door. It's like that with some experiences. They even if you have to in, in in spiritual life, you have to keep repeating your practice because you all the time fall out of it, right? But still, with that, there are some things that happens that there is no turning back anymore. It happened and it changed you for good. Yeah, you told me before we started recording that uh, sometimes when you give talks, people ask if you can turn this on and off. <laughs> I know it's it's fascinating, and and I understand from the questions that people want the answer that you can turn it off because it would be less scary to open this door if you can go back to hiding again. But of, of course you can't. Either you do feel what the other one feel, or or, or you don't. Uh, there is no turning off button, but there is uh, there is the the sense of integrity. It's like. We can both speak English, so we can choose to talk to each other. Or we could choose not to. It's an option we have. And it's the same with this kind of a meeting. You choose to go in and out of it, but you don't cl close off the ability. Yeah. So so if I go to places where, where animals or other species suffer a lot, uh, I, I have to choose for myself, is it... Uh, what is the point in me going there? Is, is there is there a point in sharing the suffering? Will it help? Can you do it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or will will I just be dragged into the suffering to the point of actually not being very helpful, and maybe it will prevent me to do some other things that I could be doing? Yeah. Uh, so, so I would have to make that choice rather than choosing to turn it off, which which I can't, obviously. Here's an interesting paragraph that i copied from your book he said for, for a herd animal like a horse it's an improbable thought that someone would deliberately make a decision that is not based on the greater good of the entire herd because mm. that's the way horses behave among themselves or which would in any way be harmful to the surrounding environment if people's will is limited to simply achieving personal gain the purpose becomes impossible to understand Mm. And that seems to be the reason why so many horses and other herd animals, seen from our perspective, respond so well, quote unquote, to manipulation. They trust that what we want is in their best interest. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I, I think the whole idea of personal gain uh, really becomes a question here. Uh, because we presume that everyone has that. <laughs> uh, because in, in our isolation... Um, I had the horses here explaining just recently that all different species experience this life differently because we have different senses, we have different bodies. Uh, if you take all the variety of plants, trees, animals, it will all be very different, but we all relate to the same reality. It's like we are showing angles of that reality. While humans, we have something extra to that, which means that we are also an angle of that reality, but we also interpret what we experience, which means that we experience it and then we have an opinion about what we experience. And that takes us away from, from the common reality. And, and I, perhaps that gap that was lifted between me and this pony is, is somewhere there, uh, which means that, that I can actually, as a human being, experience if if I do something that is harmful for someone else, perhaps I will not feel that. Perhaps I can only feel what it does to me. If if the horse jump a fence and I enjoy that, I will immediately think that the horse enjoys it too, because that's the only feeling I get. Uh, because I don't really share the horse's experience. It's like if you started to cry, my, my uh, mirror neurons would react to your tears and I would feel something. But that's not the same as me feeling what you actually go through inside. Uh, there, there is th this, this difference. Um, and, and if the self, like one horse explained, if the self is not, if the self would be the combination of, of body and soul, the merging of body and soul, we tend to see that as, as, as some, as like, like a dot. <laughs> But what if you would see it as, as a swelling balloon so that the self is just what actually harbors the world inside of you? And then if you are a herd animal, it means that you will know yourself 
as a separate being with, with integrity, but you would also feel the others inside of you, meaning that if another herd member is harmed in some way, you would feel that inside of you, which means that there would be no reason for you to harm another individual <laughs> uh, deliberately in that way, because you would feel it inside of you and you wouldn't get the sense of personal gain. Are you saying that that's the way horses tend to function ordinarily? It seems to be that way they function ordinarily. But they fight, means, right? I mean, they might bite each other, kick each other. Yeah, whatever, they do. But they, uh, the, don't they feel what the other horse is feeling if they do that? They do. It's just if you're a horse being bitten by another horse, it doesn't feel like it does when they bite you and me because they have a different skin and a different body. Uh -huh. uh, but if you form your herds, because uh, that was the question when I started to work with this, and and uh, my work is to go around and, and meet animals and and try to figure out solutions to issues of all sorts of situations. And people want to know who is the leader. And I started to try to figure out who is the leader, and I never got an answer. Well, I got an answer, but not to the leadership question. Uh, I got an answer describing every individual in the herd uh, quite detailed with focus on what they're good at. What do they contribute with? Uh, and in order to find out who you are and what you can contribute with, you have to test yourself. And you have to test yourself quite roughly. We know that. We know that our best friends are the ones that has really been through the toughest times with us and they they stayed there. We've we've tested each other, perhaps not by pushing ourselves into walls, but but when we know that I, I know the strength of my friend because we went through something. And and it seems to be the same for them. Yeah, if, here's uh, a, something from your book. You say, horses confront one another in order to find out which one is most suited to each particular task. Mm -hmm. Different responsibilities horses serve in a herd might include defender, scout, caretaker, educator, and so on. So mm -hmm. they kind of learn about themselves through this sort of friction or confrontation yeah. with each other, and then they naturally serve different functions. And there was a fascinating bit in your book where um, different horses would, would serve in the prime leadership role depending upon what the need was. Sometimes yeah. it would be looking for food. Sometimes it would be defend, defending the herd. You know, Sometimes it would be educating the young or whatever. Um, so that was all very fascinating. Yeah, and I think also because humans seem to be the only species that truly relate to to time as a linear experience, mm. which means that we are comparing everything to everything else one by one. Naturally, we put them below and above each other, which means that we we do add a sense of, of evaluation to that. Uh, if, if you have a non-linear time, uh, that would be totally different because then it's much easier to accept, it seems, um, that everything is constantly changing. So you have someone who has a very good eyesight, perhaps, in the herd, but then the sun goes down and the darkness comes, and then there is someone else who has a better, better vision in dark. Mm. And so it goes on. Someone dies, someone is born, someone is injured. Uh, they are constantly adapting to the situation. While, while we seem to seek leadership for the sake of having a leader, uh, that seems to only work in a linear time frame where we experience personal gain. If you have a non-linear time and personal gain is no longer relevant since you feel what everyone else is feeling, then what is good for you and what is also adding to the greater good is no longer in conflict. Mm. It's like if you are a very good scout, meaning that you you embody what is happening outside of the herd, you you actually that 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 makes the room bigger. So the one who is a defender or whatever you choose to call them, they can also become better at what they do. Because we, we've raised the ceiling for that. We don't we don't compete within the herd about the same position. And I think that is a huge difference um, to how we build our societies and and how we miss out on so many resources because we don't we don't know where to to, to put them right. Yes. And and we push yeah. each other down in order to make a career, which is uh, um yeah, it's it's a waste of time in a way if you Think about it that way.
Horses sound like the ideal communists from, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but do you Except think that there is no ever... elite. <laughs> right. There's no elite, which there shouldn't have been an ideal communism either. But <laughs> obviously there was because human beings are screwed up. But do you think that um, humans could ever sort of emulate horses and actually uh, begin to function in a much more egalitarian way the way they do? I, I think we could. Uh -huh. um... Uh, but I think the way to get there has to has to go through, and that's I, I guess where we meet. Uh, it, it has to go through uh, a spiritual self knowledge in a way. The, 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 there is a point where it cannot only be psychological. What happened between me and this pony was more than anything uh, a, a spiritual turning point. I think um, because it's. Um, there was a pony here describing the human being as uh, there was an image because when you experience, when I experienced this, it, it's an image with a full experience of it, feeling, sensation, you name it. So the, the image is of a human being standing and half of the person is black. And black is not a negative here. It's just black. It means it's, it's filled. It's the physical human being. Um, and, and in order to fulfill our physical part of the self, um, we need to accept reality for what it is. We have to try to stop deceiving ourselves uh, and, and, and make all these images and identities, right? And, and the other side that we long for and that we need as much as that is the invisible side, the other half that is white, and actually perhaps not white, but rather see-through. Um, is our our longing for for all of these things that we cannot phrase describe uh, the creator perhaps the the, the threads in between uh, the, the longing to to fully experience this life because it's all we have no matter what we think or what theor theories we have. Mm. You just said uh, reminds me of a, oh I'm sorry continue and and then she described. The, the role of the human being in, in, in this universe would be to be exactly in the middle between the physical and the spiritual. Mm. But we have misunderstood it. So we don't put ourselves in the middle. We put ourselves in the center. And when we put ourselves in the center, uh, then you have all the experience of the human ego. And, and then we are totally locked in ourselves. So it seems when you follow spirituality with described by animals, you all the time get to these parallel things. The self being an opening, uh, an emptiness that is an opening that can contain the entire world. But we can only do that if we empty ourselves of ourselves, but not by getting rid of the self, because then there will be no one there to receive the world, right? Right. So when you say not by getting rid of the self, you mean you can't be utterly devoid of a sense of personhood or individuality there has yeah. to be at least some remnant of that in order to yes work. and and that that personality or essence they would describe it as when body and soul merge something totally unique is being created because nothing that is born is ever the same again not totally um, whether you're a plant coming out of a seed or, or a human being born uh, or, or a chicken coming out of an egg, you are unique and your interpretation of that life will only happen once. So so the personality is, is a celebration of this life. It's not something we should get rid of. But when we, I, when we build an identity in that, that is that is something different because then the emptiness is no longer an opening. Then the emptiness actually is empty and there is no space for anything in it. So the ego would perhaps then be the, the person we create in order to fit into this world. They they would describe it as as the self in order for us to 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 really uh, become who we are in this and, and contribute in this life, we need to be seen. We need to be met by other individuals. We need to be mirrored by the life we come into. But if if the people who receive us, our family, uh, anyone around us, can't see who we really are underneath and meet us in that, in that true point of ourselves, 
then we will start creating what the world wants us to be because otherwise we can't see how we would ever survive. And, and the person we create in order to survive becomes the ego who is constantly dying because there is no connection between the ego and the soul. So the soul has no sense of eternity and is struggling to survive by the minute and needs constant food, uh, which you can see, we, we, we consume this planet. We eat ourselves through this planet like no other species does, because the ego, uh, the, the need of the ego to survive is, is endless, while the self only wants to get closer to life. The se self is looking for a relation to life, not the, the confirmation, it I'll seems, just... if this is great, Emily. I love what you, the way you speak. Uh, it reminds me of a, what you're saying just now. reminds me of a quote I lifted from your book, which is that only by living your life to the fullest is it possible to reach beyond physical existence. The way to eternity goes through through the heart, the place where the body and consciousness meet. And, um, and what you're saying about ego, there's a lot of people in spiritual circles talk about eradicating the ego and not having a person, there, there being absolutely no person and, and so on and so forth. And I always recoil against that. Um, I, I can, I'm, I'm more aligned with what you were saying, which is that the ego has usurped its proper role um, and has become kind of bloated and exaggerated and is thereby causing a whole lot of trouble. But um, you can't utterly live without it. It just has to um, be relegated to its proper role, which is kind of like in the back seat in a way. Well, well, the self or the higher consciousness drives drives the car. <laughs> it's, uh... Yes, and, and by constant practice, I guess, because what happens is that the ego will creep up. <laughs> uh, we, we will never finish in our practice. Yeah, uh, it's it's every morning, every day we will forget as we practice. I remember when I was working in. Georgia, Jordan and and uh, they have different stable managers and 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 at this particular time it was a very very religious man and and very very true to himself in how he followed that path I really admired him for that and he had everything in order all the time and I admire that too because my life tends to be very messy mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and he was sitting in his office and on that day his hair was standing out and and his desk was really not looking like it usually did so I thought there must have been some accidents it's like what happened to you today and he said well Emily you know the ego, the ego, it's every minute. <laughs> it's every minute of every day. And and it was really helpful for me to see that even this man who was so disciplined in his practice, his struggle was just like mine. <laughs> it was yeah. very refreshing in a way, actually. <laughs> yeah, constant vigilance is necessary. So, yes. There's this teacher named Papaji, and someone uh, once asked him, you know, uh, do you have to be continue to be vigilant? And he said, you know, till my dying breath. Um, yeah, and uh, it reminds me of an article that I just listened to and read both uh, twice recently by a fellow I, I interviewed about ten years ago named Jerry Freeman, and the article is called "Why There Are No Perfect Teachers." And um, since mm -hmm. it's fresh in my mind, I think I'm going to go and I'm going to create a link to that on Jerry Freeman's BatGap page. So if anyone would like to read that article, go, go to uh, Jerry Freeman on BatGap and you'll see a link. I'm going to put it there after this interview. But anyway, G Jerry is talking a lot about this and how uh, it's necessary to have some vestige of ego um, or sense of personal self in order to function as long as we're alive, uh, but how it gets out of whack and, uh, and you know, gets over, over oversteps its normal processes and becomes too dominant. And that's what's caused so much trouble. But he also talks about how there can be spiritual awakening to quite a profound degree, but um, a whole lot of stuff that we haven't worked out yet. And so we, we should never consider ourselves to be finished. We should also always consider ourselves to be a work in progress. Yes, and also what I find the more I, I work with animals in this from this aspect is that they often come to describe how important it is, and it's like you say, to be able to differentiate between what is eternal and what is tangible and changeable. And, and the only eternal thing would be basically the, the possibility of life, meaning the, the essence of the soul, the possibility of <laughs> breath coming into materia, which then creates life. Everything else is basically tangible. And 
And when humans talk about that subject, we, again, because we evaluate things all the time, we tend to like the eternal a little bit more. It's like it has a, a better value because it's lasting and the other things are not lasting. So they're perhaps not as valuable. But when you discuss this with animals, this seems to be the other way around. You have to figure out the difference so that your starting point is in the eternal. It's like you say, your starting point, your your identification with who you are shouldn't be in the tangible because it's very scary (laughs) and very confusing uh, because it's nothing to hold on to. If you have something to hold on to, that helps. And the only thing you can hold on to is, is the soul, basically. But apart from that, they love the tangible because that, that's all we have. If you only have this, this short lifetime, why don't you just dive into it and experience it? And then it's like another difference is people all the time look for the meaning of life. And, and, and animals and other species, they seem to almost get offended by it. It's like, what, what do you want something outside of this? Is this, are you not, is this not enough for you? Uh, you want another meaning outside of that this life is even possible. And and even what I would say, animals that are, are completely awake, like they've gone through spiritual awakening, like humans tend to think that only humans do. Uh, they can also describe that, that forgetfulness as a gift. The fact that perhaps you are born again and you forget all about it, or most about it anyway, makes you... You put you into a situation that you can rediscover life. You can rediscover God. Uh, it's this love of the physical life that I find very refreshing. Um, because to me, some spiritual practices with humans um, is turning away from life. It's like we want to be finished. Uh, we, we want to stop the cycling. And and But I meet enlightened people. Uh, individuals of other species that that jump straight back into life. I remember one horse, when he was dying, I was with him when he was dying, and he was just longing to get another body. He was hoping to get another body. And he was like, I don't care what you give me. Uh, If it's a short or a long life, if it's hardship or easy, I just want to get in there again. And it's this this love for existence. Uh, It's uh, I I miss that sometimes in, in, in the human concepts. Interesting. There's a, um, I, I, since this article by Jerry Freeman is fresh in my <laughs> mind, there's a point in it that relates to what you were just saying, which is that in the Brahma Sutras, it's, it's discussed that there's a thing called Lesha Vidya, which means faint remains of ignorance. And it's discussed that, that the ignorance which remains uh, is actually a tool for greater enlightenment. And even in unity consciousness, um, you it it can be broken into pieces and those pieces become the the means or the fuel through which brahman a, a greater reality is realized mm-hmm. um so l- life is not some mistake that we've the whole universe has somehow fallen into and we should just get out of and be rid of as quickly as possible mm-hmm. it's a tremendous opportunity like you say and uh there there is a trem- there is an unimaginable scope of possibility uh mm-hmm which can be realized if we just, you know, engage in the game from the, the proper perspective and not try to just escape from it ASAP. <laughs> yeah, and, and see it as something like like a riddle that we are meant to solve, and then we've solved it, and, and then yeah. what? <laughs> right, keeps on going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's a couple of themes here that come up again that are your whole teaching and your book is based upon that I want to explore with you. Um, one is the idea that animals can get enlightened because I have this bias going back decades that they can't, and I'm willing and, and eager to re-examine that. Um, and another is that uh, just the sophistication of some of these animals' thought processes that you communicate with. I mean, they some of them, in some of the passages in your book, they were saying things that I had to really put on my thinking cap to understand what yeah. they were saying, these, these <laughs> philosophical <laughs> insights and everything. Yeah. And, and, I, and, and I think, okay, wait a minute now. Horses and other animals don't even have a prefrontal cortex, which, is, which we're told is that tool that enables humans to think in sophisticated ways that other animals don't have. And so how are they thinking these thoughts? Um, And is it because it's the higher self of the animal that has all this wisdom and somehow they don't have the neurophysiology to articulate it, which we do, but that doesn't um, mean they don't, they don't have access to that kind of wisdom. Well, I've asked myself all these questions too, Mm -hmm. because I started off believing that 
humans are the only ones with an abstract th- ability to think. Yeah. And every time I think I know something, I'm <laughs> being proven wrong. <laughs> so I guess uh, that will continue also beyond this interview, of course. Uh, but uh, I guess it's where we put the consciousness. And some animals describe the consciousness as the bridge between the physical existence and the soul, the possibility for 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 materia to become aware of itself. And if if it's if it is so, we just play with that thought. If that is so, then perhaps everything that is alive knows that it's alive. That if 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 you are alive, if being alive means that soul has entered materia, uh, and that can only happen if there is consciousness connecting them, that could possibly mean that everything that is alive knows that it's alive, which means that we have a conscious expression of our experience of life constantly, no matter what we are. Um, but I I think as humans, what we have done with our gap and our personal gain and all of the things we discussed in the beginning is that we we are doing what we've also done to other human beings we take away their 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 person we depersonalize them and then we take what we want so if black people don't feel anything then we can use them as slaves right I mean, we believe that the children couldn't feel pain not long ago. Oh, uh, and, and so they, yeah, sure. And I mean, De, I think it was Descartes uh, who popularized the notion that animals are just machines and they don't yeah. even have consciousness and they don't feel pain. And the noises they make if we call, inflict pain upon them are just some like mechanical, yeah, thing going on. And 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 that is that makes it easier for us to take what we want. If right. if we if our ego needs constant food, that's a way of doing it, right? Yeah, I mean the Nazis and also like in, in the conflict in Rwanda, they were referring to people yeah. as as cockroaches. You know, yeah. so you can do whatever you want because it's just like a yeah. cockroach. Yeah, uh, and and the scary thing is that we are able to do that to ourselves. So yeah. I guess the way back is to to again meet everyone in person <laughs> it's like okay this tree is a person this, this tuft of grass is a person it's not a human but it is someone yeah. um, and perhaps that someone doesn't have a nervous system like the tree it doesn't mean that the tree's experience of life is limited the experience can be deeply philosophical uh, devoted and, and, and religious uh, but the tree would not be able to phrase it because the tree wouldn't have the need to phrase it, because the tree constantly is in this experience, most likely in connection to other trees. And when, where do one tree begin and how is the soul and consciousness in plants? That's another fascinating question. So if if you let a seed down and that seed's become another tree, from which point are the two of you being isolated? Is it different souls in these two trees? Um, uh, is it, uh, or is it, different consciousness or what is even the question relevant? (laughs) Well, my Uh, guess is that that there would be different souls superficially and mm -hmm. one soul fundamentally, Mm -hmm. just the way on the Mm -hmm. the ocean, you have different Mm -hmm. waves uh, superficially, Mm -hmm. but it's all really the same ocean. If you go a little deeper. Yeah. So anyway, we have this, this common consciousness and we have the individual and we have the individual person that could experience all these things that are written about in this book. Uh, I am the one putting words on it. Uh, uh, to the experience of sharing that instant now with another species. And and then, of course, it's like a conversation between you and me. We, we meet tonight because we are very interested in spiritual philosophical questions. Naturally, when we talk to each other, that's what we're going to talk about, even if it wasn't a job, <laughs> right? Uh, and it's the same with me and the tree, because I am so interested in life and existence and spiritual matters and, and human and, and all of these things. Uh, that will come up in the conversation, most likely. Mm. Um, of course, not every animal or plant is interested in what I'm interested in. But sometimes you meet a kindred spirit. And regardless of what species that is, there there will be creativity in that meeting point. It's like uh, there are horses in the herd that 
for, for, for lack of a better word, because I know that the minute you put a word on someone's role in a herd, you've fixated it and it's not good because you create an identity and it's not what we want. But I tend to call them memory carriers. And, and I, I, I met them at first uh in in jordan um where an old mare was close to pass over to the other side and she was sharing her time with another mare uh and and they were passing on they were passing on something and i thought that the memory carrier uh, knowing the history of her herd and and her species kept all that in her mind and that she had to teach the other horse all of these things so the other horse would also remember it and they tried to explain to me that the stories only appear in the moment of sharing. It's not that an individual continuously remembers them like, like a computer. Uh, they only become alive when we truly meet each other. So who does the story belong to if I meet a tree and, and, and experience this, this deep philosophical co conversation? Uh, was it in the tree before and recorded into me or did it happen because we met? Uh, because we share, uh, something happens when, when our consciousness are, are, are meeting in the same point. Uh, but I think that the, the need to, to put it into an explanation, that would be a human need. That, that is no need for the tree. But I believe that the tree still experiences something very valuable in the moment of sharing. Not, not, not in the explanation. Like if, I, if I meet somebody that I went to high school with, we might all of a sudden start having all these discussions about things we experienced in high school, which both of us have forgotten about for 50 something years. Um, isn't that, is that what you're, you're saying? And, and, but then those memories come up because it's relevant to our particular yeah. interaction. Yeah, I, yes. I guess it could be like that. Yes, yeah. definitely. Okay. Because, because we, we, we cross path and we have, I have a pony at, at home. And she describes time as, as you know, uh, as, as yarn, but, but not put together neatly. It, it's a uh -huh. mess, like a, a tangled. completely messy, yes, a tangled, messy yarn. So because time, we, when we think about it as parallel, uh, we, we, we tend to think like, like these neat little lines that as if we would stack books on top of each other. So that's not how time acts. It comes and goes and it meets it. It keeps meeting itself in all these variety of angles. Uh, there is a chronological time uh, represented by the thread itself, but the way it meets itself is actually totally irregular. And and I I like that thought because it, it means that we are not just sort of puppets controlled by destiny. It matters what we do when we enter time and we have choices. Um, but it seems like all other species have it too. And we're missing out because for some reason we believe that we are the only ones that go through these developments. Um, we seem to be the most isolated species in the sense that we create an identity that is very clear. It's like for me as a human being, it's very obvious when I am dead and when I am alive. There's no doubt about that. You you weren't born, but one minute later you are, and you are alive and then you're not. And for other species, it seems to be a lot more floating, how you come and go, what your identi uh, identity is. It's like, yes, it's I identify with myself, but I also carry the herd. Um, if I am a plant, uh, and I decay, uh, I, I, I die partly, perhaps. Uh, and, and I turn into my body, turn into something else. Uh, and, and I am aware of that. So, so I, I think in our isolation, we miss out on so many dimensions of, of life. Um, and, and to, to me, the, the spiritual path is, is more about being able to, to, truly appreciate this life more than reaching something outside of it really because we are already in in constant we live inside of the creator in a way yeah no, um, I agree. um i was a student of a famous spiritual teacher and one time he said to me um he said every day is life he said don't pass over the present for some glorious future yeah <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what you're saying then about plants and animals is that, if I may, if I've interpreted it correctly, is that they're more tuned into um, 
the collective, first of all, mm -hmm. uh, of their herd, of their species, of the forest or whatever. And also they're more tuned into that level of life, which um, is more fundamental than the comings and goings of individual bodies. So that yeah. um, the, 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 the death of the body is not as big a deal to them as it is to someone who is tightly identified yeah. with, with their individuality and unaware of the more universal nature. It seems to be like that. It seems to, for us, perhaps not our uh, our opinion of death, but but our fear of dying is that it's a kind of extinction to us. Yeah, people feel like um, this. They think this is what I am. I'm nothing yeah. more than this. And <laughs> if mm. this dies, I'm done. Yeah, it, and, and everything is done because there is nothing that can no longer relate to anything. So it's the end of all things in a way. Right. Um, but if you are aware of the cycle of the body, because, I mean, the body will incarnate as well. I mean, it's the same molecules going, yeah. creating another body. We actually uh, have molecules and atoms in our bodies that were in Jesus's body and Buddha's mm -hmm. body. And, yeah. you know, and, we're very um, grateful for those. <laughs> yeah, but not um, necessarily Elvis Presley, because he was too recent. So there hasn't been time <laughs> for the molecules to circulate around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's a gift for someone else <laughs> right. yeah. um, but also the it seems to be that the experience of life itself to, to us death it's is outside of life in a way but when when because it is outside of time um uh, and, and and animals seems to agree that that death is outside of time i mean they taught me that <laughs> it's not my idea um but it's not the end of the journey to them no nor is it for us but we just don't realize it most a lot of us now this thing about hierarchies um i, I want to see if i can get you to agree that there are hierarchies but there aren't hierarchies and let me explain what i mean by that so, and maybe I can't, but let's say one of your horses has intestinal parasites. And so you give it ivermectin or whatever is used to treat intestinal parasites. And your intention is to kill the parasites because you consider the horse to be more valuable than the parasites, which are living in its intestines, right? So there's some kind of value judgment there. Horse is more important than parasites. Let's kill the parasites. Uh, is, wouldn't that imply a hierarchy? Mm, I, I wouldn't. I would have thought the way you you describe it a while ago. Now the horses are beginning to teach us so much about how the grazing animals relate to grass and the ground, uh, and the and the and the microbes <laughs> underneath the soil uh, that we are actually not using these deworming things anymore because we don't want to cut that cycle we try to find other solutions natural more natural ones yes and and also it's it it becomes a problem i mean horses are meant to have a certain amount of of parasites uh, to actually keep balanced but not too many the reason why they become too many is actually because we are destroying the land the way we treat the land and the way we put too many horses in the same paddocks or or not in in, in tuned with all the other species so yeah, but perhaps let me take the another horses, example. Okay, let's say perhaps children. the horses couldn't exist without the parasites. So Maybe. at this point, uh, at this point, uh, there is there is a change in me in that particular area at the moment. Yeah. All right. Well, let's say another example. Okay, mosquitoes spread malaria, and so um, we don't want children to die of malaria. So we kill the mosquitoes as many as we can and get mosquito nets uh, to starve the mosquitoes if necessary so they won't suck blood out of the children and give them malaria. So we're valuing the children above the mosquitoes. So there's, again, some kind of hierarchical judgment there. I'm not sure I would call it hierarchical, but I see what you mean. I'm thinking that for everyone who is alive, uh, again, we, we speak about appreciating life and how that is also a spiritual perhaps the center of the spiritual quest in a way, because it leads us back to life. Everything that is alive will try to survive. I mean, um, uh, a horse that would be attacked by, by a mountain lion will try to survive uh, un until the very, very end. The mountain lion will try to, to, to kill the horse in order to survive and risk its own life to feed its own children. Uh, we are all designed to do what we need to do in order to survive. But is that a sign of cruelty or is there a deeper balance in the system? Um, 
So of course, if 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 a mosquito would kill my child, I would I would kill the mosquito to save my child because it would be a natural instinct to preserve life. It doesn't necessarily mean that I think my child is more valuable than than the mosquito, but it is my instinct to do so, and it's the love for my child and the, and the fear of what will happen if I lose this child. Of course, also the, the more selfish part. The mosquito uh, will do the same. And from the mosquito's angle, because that's what we are designed to do. And and if this happens in a balance, um, the I mean the 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 animals chasing the horses will make them run in a particular way that is actually good for the grass. When we keep horses separate, uh, and and we try to protect them from everything, it changes their pattern of grazing. So they become sick, and the pastures become sick. So we had to figure out systems, how we can actually make them run. And I wouldn't say that we frighten them because we don't want to cause anything negative, but we do need to get them stressed and excited to the point of recreating how they are supposed to move because otherwise they don't stay healthy. So so I guess we, we are designed to meet in this play uh, of, of, of life and death and interaction between bodies. If, if that becomes cruel or creates suffering in us, it will uh, at times, but perhaps it doesn't necessarily have to be, I don't think it's possible to live a life without pain, but, but when we move towards suffering, then it's more of a question how we look at it, I suppose. Yeah. Pain, well, I, I think, is inevitable. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I think we, it doesn't mean I don't need to dislike the mosquito. I don't need to hate the mosquito. I will do what I'm designed to do for, for my species to survive, as would the others. But I think when we have this gap to all the other species, we are losing a sense of value and a sense of self-respect. Yeah. So, so we have a short-sightedness in our way of interacting that other species obviously don't have because they are not destroying the planet the way we do. I totally agree. And um, there's some kind of balance point in here I'm trying to find. So obviously we're in the midst of the sixth great mass extinction and, and mm. hundreds of species go extinct just about every day. And I don't know what the, there's, there's just been a huge um, reduction in wildlife populations and yeah. uh, over the, the last decades, and it seems to be accelerating. And I mean, we're cutting down the rainforest in Indonesia to plant palm trees to get palm oil, and it's it's eradicating the, this, the habitat of the orangutans and and so on. So there's this human uh, hubris and egotism and greed and and sense of superiority that makes us feel that. These other species are disposable, and you know we can we can dispose of them in order to gain some economic advantage. And that, obviously, that is terrible, and it's destroying the world. Um, now, holding that thought in mind, um, can we also think that well, there are levels of complexity in nervous systems and levels of sophistication of function, and I'd rather be a human being than than a mosquito because. It's higher up the evolu the biological evolutionary scale and possibly the spiritual evolutionary scale if we define that as the ability to cognize and embody pure consciousness and you know express it and live it in daily life. Yeah, I, I would see that as a circle more. Uh, it's like if you if you have a herd of horses, you could see that there is one horse that none of the other horses can move around. Um, almost none. And then there is one that perhaps most of the horses can shift around, but can bet on it. If the, if the herd is big enough, the area is big enough, and, and their way of expressing, as expressing natural life is as big enough <laughs> that the one that everyone else is shifting around is the only one that can move the one horse that no one else can move. This, the, it always becomes a circle in the end. Moving uh, means like the, the the horse that can't be moved is just sort of stubborn and strong. Yes, exactly. And no, one, yeah. no one can tell him what to do. Yeah, no other, one can shift his place. And the other guy, everybody uh, can push him around. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and then it makes you confused because it's like, but why can he? Because we, again, we look for a line. Uh, and I think, I think a hierarchy is an expression of a line. And when you bring it into a circle, it becomes confusing. So, okay, so yes, we, we are definitely uh, one of the most complex individuals on the planet. Is that good or bad, or is it just complex? Uh, 
Um, well, the whole universe and, has grown from simplicity to complexity over the past 13.7 yes. billion uh, years. Um, it seems absolutely. to be the direction of evolution. Yes, and you can you can experience it as an evolution because it, if life is so hungry in wanting to experience itself, it will keep creating more and more complexity in order for more diversity. That would be natural. But do we need to, to put it on a scale? Uh, or can the experience of being a mosquito be as fulfilling and, and spiritually fulfilling, even if the mosquito wouldn't express it? Uh, because, I mean, I, I contain of all these microbes. Is, is a bacteria a someone? I wouldn't be able to answer that question. But what am I actually containing? Am I really just one person? <laughs> I mean, can we... I don't have an answer to that. I just like to to disturb my thoughts a little bit. Well, we're all uh, conglomerates. I mean, we can each yeah. contain, you know, 40 to 100 trillion cells. Yeah. And most of them aren't human because of the, the microbiome is all these non-human cells and we can't live yeah. without it. And so it, it's it's important, obviously. But um, and, and how does it affect the consciousness? If, if a tree or a plant or, or an insect can have... Um, Equal to me as a human, uh, a, a complex um, and, and a spiritual experience of, of awakening, um, then it, perhaps that is not tied to the complexity in itself. Our ability to to explain it and to share it and to create art would be different. And 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 I think again, uh, like we say that. That, that the humans have this interpretation and it makes us isolated. And we've seen the negative effects of that quite strongly on the planet, all of those things you just said. But what if there is also a positive aspect, aspect to that? What if we can actually add things to this creation? I still wouldn't say that it would make us better or more evolved. It's just a typically human thing. <laughs> Uh, perhaps we could use that as a creativity, but it wouldn't be creative unless we have opened the self to include the rest of the world. It will only be creative when we are no longer ruled by the ego or, or no longer ruled by personal gain. For as long as, as we are tempted by personal gain, um, the gap between us and the rest of, of the world uh, will sadly, I think, be destructive. Uh, the good thing is that that it's it's possible for us to open up ourselves and our selves <laughs> to include the rest of the reality, and then we would no longer be so destructive because we wouldn't be we wouldn't be drawn to that. I, I remember once in one of the classes we had in this school that is, is run by horses because they give us all the exercises. And and this was in early, it was about this time of the year or, or beginning of April. And in Sweden, it's cold. Uh, and we were supposed to, to, to connect with insects. We were gathering early in the morning in a forest and it was foggy and rainy and dull and gray. And we were supposed to meet insects. And I was thinking, I must have missed something in this conversation because it's too cold. There are no insects. Um, but I don't want to go against the idea of the horses because I, I trust them to see the entirety better than what I do. So it's like we better follow their path because we've let humans decide and, and be the boss for long enough. And we, we, we've seen where that took us. So let's try <laughs> another version. So we all gathered in the forest and, and waiting for insects to come out. And after like about two hours, I saw this tiny fly. I don't know what you call them in English. In Swedish, we call them knot. They are tiny. They are like Maybe a, a millimeter. Gnat. We have gnat, yeah. G-N-A-T. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yes, it will be that. Uh, and normally they really, they annoy you because they bite and it burns and they're right. in the way and you just want them to disappear, right? Yeah. But now, after waiting for one for two hours and connecting to this tiny flying dot, which was one of the most fascinating things I've ever done, and how an entire person can fit into that tiny body and have a full experience of life and, and knowing the creator in doing so. Uh, I mean, I will never forget it. And, and then I was thinking, well, so if we were truly connected to this planet, we wouldn't need almost anything to be fascinated by life. I mean, we, we really don't need to be so hungry for all these spectacular experiences. It's if we truly connect to the rest of the life on this planet, 
in a way, that's all we need. So, so we wouldn't naturally not be so destructive because we wouldn't all the time look for things outside of ourselves. It's all inside of ourselves, truly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I guess where I'm skeptical, and I don't know if you're going to be able to convince me in this conversation. Is, well, I have no need to convince you, so that's fine with me. I know, but yes, uh, it's fun <laughs> to talk about it. Uh, it's just that you know the the idea that a gnat can have uh, an experience that's as rich and full as a human being can have, given the gnat's you know extremely limited nervous system and sensory capabilities. I mean, obviously, there are all kinds of animals that have more sensory perception than we do. Bats and dogs, and you know, all kinds of animals can perceive things we can't perceive. But in terms of being able to know oneself as one with God, um, consciously, the way, a, you know, an enlightened being or enlightened saint can do, I'm just a little mm. skeptical there. No, I, uh, I, yeah, I, I understand that, and I totally respect that. I think, yeah. from the Nats' point of view, that's the starting point. Uh huh. I, I think they never really left the Creator, um, which means that the the journey we are speaking about enlightenment as as a journey from being unaware to becoming aware, mm -hmm. and to find the invisible, because the invisible. Uh, and 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 the eternal and the tangible, they are they are disconnected to us. So we need to reconnect them. We need to to find someone. If if, if the consciousness is the bridge between uh, between the soul and the body, we need to find someone who can walk that distance. Mm -hmm. And 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 the one who walks that distance, it's it's quite important that he doesn't fall asleep on on the way, because then we have to start all over again, which we do daily because we constantly fall asleep, right? What if you never fell asleep? Then you wouldn't know anything else, and it wouldn't really be a journey. What if the rest of the planet is is already there, and and the ones doing the journey is us? So when we walk that that distance, we we enter in into the life where where everyone already is, and and they are actually receiving us, uh, and, and they seem to be happy. They seem to want us to to come and join the party. Even with all our destructiveness and all the suffering that we keep creating, uh, they seem to to really welcome us and and help us along the way. So if if we saw them as as never disconnected, um, we wouldn't need to believe it to be true or not, or or or, or to be to be to be able to explain it or not. But what if we just gave that a chance? Uh, we could learn uh, so much. Uh, from other species that we have no idea that we could because we just presume that they would have nothing to say in the matter. Yeah. Well, species certainly have a lot to say. I mean, judging from your book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, well, it's just um, me I, that I, can't be quiet. <laughs> no, 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 no. You're doing great. But um, I believe this is what Ken Wilber calls the pre-trans fallacy, which is that there are certain characteristics of quote unquote more primitive life forms like gnats uh, that seem uh, similar to supposed characteristics of enlightened beings. They're completely in tune with nature. They're completely spontaneous. They're just acting on natural instinct and doing exactly what they're supposed to do, uh, given their role in life and so on. And th those things could all be said of, of someone who's enlightened. Um, the messy part is unenlightened people who are in the middle, who have free will, who have lost the connection with nature and haven't regained it in a deeper sense in terms of being becoming consciously aware of the Godhead of, of pure consciousness and, and then having their life completely in the flow of that cosmic intelligence. And so then we create all kinds of trouble. I mean, the world would be just fine if there were no humans and it were all just all the animals doing their thing. And the world will also be fine if there are only enlightened people and animals, but, um, you know, there are no people to cause all the problems we cause. The problems arise when we're in this teenage phase as, as yep. a species and we're, we're exercising our free will, but without the, the requisite wisdom to exercise it wisely. Yeah. Uh, I would agree with that. Okay. Um, but I'm also thinking that. I would add then one thing to mm -hmm. to to the gnat or anyone else who is just doing what they are designed to be doing, but perhaps they 
perhaps they know that that is what they're doing. It doesn't just happen yeah. uh, because they are designed like that and, and they're not just sort of uh, without will being guarded around by the creator. Maybe they know that that is happening. And if they know that, then they can tell about that experience and that can remind us what we are missing. And it reminds me of the gap. And when I am reminded by the gap, perhaps my longing to find the creator yet again mm -hmm. is being um, uh, is becoming more awake than it was before. Yeah. Well, I would say my spin on that would be that certainly... The but the gnat... knowledge, sorry, but the knowledge would then not be related to the brain of the gnat. It would be the spiritual awareness of the net yeah and that's it, yeah. Is, is the consciousness is the consciousness tied to the brain or is it tied to the soul and then i'm thinking well i couldn't have had that conversation with all of these individuals if it was to the brain because a tree wouldn't have a brain a tree wouldn't have an image of the world that i could ever even relate to yeah but we can still meet and in that meeting point perhaps a tiny bit of a translation can be passed on to me as a human it will always be distorted in some sense because the minute my brain knows what i'm experiencing it's no longer the tree it's me right so it's basically being lost the moment it's being found so whatever i'm trying to put words on will always be limited but you would still die for that glimpse because that reality of sharing another individual's experience of life it's still even if it's just a glimpse and that's all you can you can pull out and try to put words on it will still be worth it because of the, the the love of the creation i suppose yeah now i know you've had fairly sophisticated conversations with chickens uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um have you ever had a meaningful conversation with a gnat or a worm or a slug or you know some m much more rudimentary yeah, life yeah. form have you yes yes but it would be um i think the limitation is with me uh because when I have a conversation with, with a horse or a dog, with animals that lives with people, then we have a lot of common ground. Uh, we know what it's like to go for a walk. We know what it's like to go for a ride. We have lots to talk about that my brain can relate to. So my brain is really happy and, and, uh, and responds. And I remember the first time I got in connection with an insect was in a parking lot outside of a shop. And I saw a parking lot. It would look the same to me and you. But... For the insect, this experience of the parking lot, it was completely different colors that I couldn't even relate to. It felt hilly and, and it was a completely different planet. And, and it didn't even know about me or humans. I realized that, okay, so I'm, I'm not at all in the center of this insect's life. It's so different to me that it's very hard for me to follow. So it becomes less of a conversation and more of an instinctive experience you, you get this sort of experience of what it's like to be that and then it's gone again and for a long time i thought that <laughs> this is funny for a long time i thought that other species communicate in these sort of tiny dots <laughs> it took me years to realize that it's no it's my awareness i fall asleep all the time <laughs> so so all i can get is glimpses because then i fall out again and then i struggle to get in to be able to listen again so, so the limitation would be mine because I need to stretch my, my abstract ability to what cannot even be compared to the human experience. Uh, and, and I do that every time I experience something that is outside of my comfort zone, if you would call it that, or, or what has been experienced so far. But it would take me forever. So, so in, in this lifetime, I'm more likely to have longer conversations with animals that I have more uh, that are less abstract to me. Right. This is making it, it more is what I believe right now, anyway. Yeah, this is making more sense to me as I go along with you here. Um, <laughs> here here's 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 a insight that might help. So <laughs> I think we probably both agree that there is universal consciousness, universal intelligence. It permeates and orchestrates everything. Are we on the same page with that? Mm, yeah. Okay, so that being the case, that universal consciousness is our very essence. Yours, mine, the, the camera, the gnat, the the in other, you know, the worm, whatever. Uh, if they are conscious, or even if they're not conscious, that consciousness permeates them, 
or and and if if they are conscious to some degree, then they are, are a reflector of that consciousness in a certain way, depending mm-hmm. upon the nature of their ner- nervous system. Mm-hmm. Agreed. And the character of their personality, and, if you ask yeah, me. Yeah, which which is related to the nature of their nervous system, I suppose. Um, so maybe, like you say, with the insect, for instance, who sees the parking lot so differently than you can barely conceive of it, um, you know, and it is a conscious experience for them. They have senses. Um, and, you know, that universal consciousness is, uh, it's, it's active in them as just as it's active in us. They wouldn't be able to function were it not. And uh, and there's some kind of higher value. There's some sort of level of that consciousness which is not just unmanifest, but is is active, engaged, creative, orchestrating things. And you're able to t- you Emily are able to tune into that as it relates to or as it interfaces with. The gnat. We're, we're really picking mm. on gnats in this interview. Um, <laughs> you know, that was and, unexpected, wasn't it? <laughs> I know. And, and therefore, therefore, there actually can be some kind of meaningful communication um, because you're not just communicating with the limited gnat consciousness. You're communicating with the archetype or the um, the deva. You could say, you know, the word deva, right? Of it's the, like the spirit of of the gnat kingdom. Um, <laughs> And, and that spirit could be quite wise and quite profound. Well, there's a great thing in your in your thing here. Uh, this is from the Maori medicine woman. She said, if you're no longer able to communicate with the plants, yeah. and instead reduced to having to read about their knowledge, then you should not be working with medicine. So how do you communicate with plants? You obviously communicate with the with the deva or the spirit of the plant in question. I think it is the same. It is all the same idea. Um I think, um, to me, all of these individuals will still be persons, individuals, as well as the common consciousness that we spoke about. There is also an individual translating it or living it. I would say perhaps living it is a better word. You mean like an individual Uh, plan? Yes, because otherwise, what would be the point of individuals? Uh, Why would life have this urge to experience all these different angles? Because it's becoming personalized. Every tiny gnat <laughs> will still experience it slightly different from the other one. And that yeah. seems to be a sense of humor in life and the longing in life to keep re-experiencing itself with such a force that we can we, we cannot grasp it because it's so much bigger than us. But when we don't have an ego surrounding it, perhaps it goes through in a way easier. Perhaps it's just a I'm not saying it is so, but perhaps it is so. Uh, and then whatever species you communicate to would be less relevant uh, because you're still meeting someone. If it's a plant, if it's a tree, the the, the difference between a plant, I think, and, and why that's never been so popular as animal communication is that it's harder for us as humans to know the form we are relating to. There is no nervous system. There is no head. There is no feet. Uh, the whole concept of beginning and end is complicated uh, because some develop because they they develop longer roots and all of a sudden there is another plant popping out of the same root. Is it two different plants or who am I talking to? What if it's not really relevant and if I let that go and I just open myself to receive the being of this plant and, and I leave my ideas and opinions aside for a moment because otherwise there is no emptiness for the plant to, to come in. And then I just see what happens. And and um, to me, the, the experience of, of, of plants is that I often communicate uh, gifts, what they are good for, how they contribute. Um, and, and what do you find when you do this? I mean, I've done this as a full-time job for the past almost 30 years, um, is that nature seemed to be very generous. We live on a planet where generosity is one of the of the keys. It's like everything that is alive seemed to have a natural generosity. It always creates more than what it needs just to survive for itself. It's like the chickens would explain the same thing. Not every egg is supposed to be a chicken. There are also eggs that are supposed to be food. We give more than what we need 
for ourselves. It's just that humans, we seem to forget that, that we are also beings on this planet. We're supposed to be generous. And when we constantly relate to what we gain from something, we, we trade. Uh, we don't share. We, we trade. It's different. Nature doesn't do that. It, it constantly gives. And with plants, I think you, you get really reminded of that. And that's how they are also explain that even when we destroy this planet, if, if we just leave it for a, a long enough time, it will start healing itself. It's, it's, it's the generosity that makes that possible because there is already an extra in each tuft of grass, in, in each tree that will give something back to the earth. If we have destroyed it badly enough with whatever radioactive substances or chemicals or whatever, perhaps we also need to put on some conscious acting into that. But nature in itself is healing because it's in its nature. And that's why it's not revengeful. It's like we're waiting for nature to hit back. It's like we continue to destroy it until it hits back. But that's perhaps not likely to happen. It's the consequence of our actions might hit back. But there, there is no thought in nature to be harmful to teach you something. Nature seems to teach through compassion. It's, it's, the, it's the entire idea of teaching is... The more I am able to feel inside of me the effect of my actions, the more I learn. I don't really learn as much from being punished. And that's what we see when we punish dogs and horses to do as they're told, because we believe that they live in a hierarchy where the leader is punishing them, so it's natural. But why is it then when I meet animals that are perfectly obedient uh, and perhaps even very good in, in competitions or whatever, and they're totally submissive, they are never happy. I mean, they should naturally be happy. We are not happy in submission. We know that. Why, why would anyone else be? And I think that's where the idea of a hierarchy can become harmful. Not the, the way you describe it from an evolutionary point of view, but we need to recreate the circle of it. Because otherwise we tend to believe that by bringing us to the top and, and having a different sense of value when we look at the others, we are losing the, the possibility of, of entering into this reality. And And to me, that is... What is the point of spiritual awakening if it doesn't happen here, if it doesn't happen from the heart and, and, and we can't share it with the rest of the life? It's not a career. We're not making a spiritual career. We're not moving on to somewhere else where, uh, where there is a university class for the best ones, right? We, we're, we're diving into the eternal, unconditional, compassionate love that we came from. Whether we're good or bad, we're, we're going to end up there. That's beautiful. You're so eloquent. I really appreciate this. Um, I was kind of reminded as you're speaking of the, a movie by Michael Moore I think, called "Where Should We Invade Next?" And I think he was. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh, but it's very, it's very human, isn't it? Yeah, and he was talking about the the prison system in I don't know whether it was Sweden, Denmark, Norway, one of the Scandinavian countries, and he was saying it's it's almost like a country club. I mean, these people are treated yeah. so nicely, <laughs> and that they really rehabilitate, and they have very low recidivism rates and everything compared to the the punishment mentality that we have in the US and probably other places. Um, so, God, this is so interesting. Um, well, here's, okay, so here's a thing. And there's a number of things I'd like to talk to you about. Um, one is that you, you've sort of subtly alluded to it just now. Um, I, and there were parts in your book which made me think of it, which I think you feel maybe in part because of your communication with with horses and other animals and also just your own your own insights that society is undergoing a big transition right and um let's talk about that a little bit um i mean there's certain things i live in iowa which is in the, in the middle of the us and there are something like i don't know 22 or 3 million pigs in iowa and 3 million people um and those pigs don't have very good lives. Most of them live in in CAFOs, which are these confinements of twelve hundred hogs that you can't can't even turn around because they're so so tightly confined. And it pollutes the environment. It pollutes the air. Iowa has the second highest cancer rate in uh, the country. Um, so all kinds of problems from it. Um, I don't. So when I see something like that, I can't imagine uh, an enlightened society in which such a thing could exist. So what do you see as, what's your vision of 
uh, an ideal world that we might hopefully come to realize? And how would our treatment of animals, what would it look like in such a world? And what do we need to do to help transition to that world? And what are we doing to retard our transitioning to that world? (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, I think... I believe that a truly compassionate experience, and and compassionate to me would mean the expansion of the self to include others than me. I I believe that's the only way to to really come to an insight that would that would change me, that would motivate me to change. <clears throat> because I believe punishment would only last for a short while. We watch a horrible movie uh, or, or someone who is filming the, the reality of these pigs. And for a couple of weeks, no one will eat pig meat because it's you just can't. Because it's painful for you to see that movie and you don't want to contribute. But then you forget. There are actually and laws the, against taking movies yeah. like that. You, you get yeah. you can get arrested if <laughs> you bring a camera is. into one of these places. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. <laughs> so that's not possible then. But some sometimes there are these these brave people that do these things. Right, right? they sneak a camera in or something. Yeah, uh, but we forget that, and and eventually we we go back to our tradition and culture because because that's that's the easiest, right? Uh, so so I, I believe we we need to practice. Um, we need to practice compassion from when we're small. I think one big mistake is that we we tend to believe that humans are the only ones that can feel compassion, as if that would be inbuilt. And without doing anything, we're just going to be in that state. Um, and I think we definitely have the possibility to become compassionate, but we need to constantly practice. Because when we don't constantly practice an opening, it will just naturally start closing our, I- itself, because that's that's how it goes. And, and the reason why I really believe in this is that I've had the experience of animals talking about life after death. <clears throat> and I've met people that talk about life after death. And, and the interesting thing is that their stories are exactly the same. It's not just a little bit similar. And, and if you're really trying to look, you can see some similarities. They are exactly the same. Uh, on the dot, the same. And, and and the key in, in these stories, the way I see it so far, um, is that all of these individuals describe that that after you pass, you pass over and you leave your body here and your experiences goes back and, and is planted in the soil in a way quite beautifully. You bury the body and the experience of the body is also being transformed because we have cellular memory, right? Um, and then the soul continues on its journey somehow. And and everyone keeps explaining the same thing. And it's that at one point you meet a being. It's never really described as a person, but it's still someone. And this someone is, is so loving that there is no words that can describe it, really. It's, it's this complete, uh, compassionate, unconditional love. And, and with the presence of this extremely loving non-judgmental being you go through your entire life and the animals will describe it as you go through every second of it not just the sort of uh, main traces or or big events or whatever most important conclusions but every single second you relive your life um and because you're outside of time, it's not relevant how long it will take. You have all the time in the world. And, and if you're out of time, you're, 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 you're actually also outside of, of any form. So, so there's no limitation to how many individuals can go through this at the same time because you are no longer in a place, right? Um, and with this going through your entire life with this compassionate being is that you know, you don't only experience what you've done yourself, but you experience how the rest of the world have experienced you. So you get the full compassionate insight into how your life has been. And of course, you could choose to see that as a punishment if you believe in that there has to be justice, because if you have killed someone and you will truly experience how the other one experienced that, well, there is an insight in that. But it's not brought to you as a punishment because it's brought to you with this complete compassion because there seems to be nothing else that would make you dare to become so vulnerable that you can truly receive that experience 
So and 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 what with all these insights, then then the people with with near death experiences, they tend to go back to life after that. So the story sort of ends there, if I've understood it right. I, I haven't had it myself. But some animals continue this story by saying that after this this deep insight in in your your life as an entirety, uh, you you go into a state of forgetfulness, and 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 no one knows what happens there. And and to most of the species that describes this. That is also where God comes into it, or that creator, whatever you choose to call it, because that is beyond the individual awareness. There is no longer any individual that can remember anything. There is complete nothingness. And the, the big, the great mystery, uh, and why there perhaps is a God, is because no one knows what happens there. But out of this nothingness, where everything merges together in, in some... Um, nothing and everything at the same time. The individual is born again. Out of that comes the individual. Uh, the seed that sprouts, the, the person that is born, comes out of that. And that is the, the big mystic miracle that no one can ever explain. And, and perhaps we don't want to explain it because it would take something away, right? But but if you think about that that learning and that insight, what if the only way for us to come to a true insight in what we're doing is through compassion? Then... It, 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 that seems somehow logic to me. And when we bring humans into the room of having animal teachers, like we do here, uh, there is something about that meeting point, because the, if the animals are what we describe, they are already in connection with with a, with a, with a greater whatever. Um, but I would also say that there are scales there. When we say the animals can also make the journey, uh, because animals that are brought to our civilization, and like the pigs you describe, <clears throat> like chickens in a factory, like horses that are being whipped in a riding school, they can also lose that connection. Uh, it just seems that their way back is perhaps a bit straighter and shorter than ours. If they get reminded, it's like they more quickly go back into it. While with humans... We tend, and I guess that has to do with our identification and our ability to interpret what we experience. We like habit. If you have a dog that has been abused by a man wearing a, a blue sweater, uh, that dog will, even after the treatment of, of post-traumatic stress disorder and the entire healing process, most likely this dog will avoid men with blue sweaters for the rest of its life because it's a survival instinct. But a human in the same situation is sadly likely to marry the man with the blue sweater. Why, why do we uh, choose habit? Over destructiveness. <laughs> yeah, we we seem to to feel so safe with the habit that it's worth the risk. Even if we know we will die from the habit, we know we we can die if we smoke, but the habit is stronger. Uh, and perhaps that's why our we have more twists and turns on our road. So when we animals have animals can get into bad habits, I mean they've done. Oh, they definitely can. You know, where can. rats are given cocaine yeah. or whatever, they get addicted. Yeah. You know. they, they can, they can, definitely. But it takes an unnatural environment for that to happen. Right, right. And I guess it's the same for us. Yeah, uh, we've created an unnatural <laughs> environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, but if you have, for example, like we have in this place, we have animals that have been abused. Uh, and most of them has had some sort of level of post-traumatic stress disorder, they heal it. Right. And then they meet people. Uh, and I guess when when we enter a room with our physical being, our stories come with us, whether they are spoken of or not. Um, so when you have these animals that have healed or are in a process of healing, and they have no judgmental ability uh, because because they don't, build their world on opinions uh, then it something happens to us something happens to us in in our courage and vulnerability to meet ourselves when we have an animal present compared to if they were not so i think that there is there's a, a great chance for us to dare to go one step further to this to practice meeting god when we leave this body how much of that can be done here uh, on this planet so that we can come to these insights and give back this love. What if, if this planet is a reflection of 
of the other side, of outside of time, how much can we bring back from there already when we are alive? Like the, the Sufis are talking about dying while you are still alive. Um, and, and, and I meet animals that speak about that as well. <clears throat> and one horse, uh, he was so sick that he, he was really preparing to die. And he invited me to be with him. And me and another horse, because I said there is always a witness. When someone is doing this, there is always a witness so that the story will be brought back to the living. Uh, so it was me and another horse sitting with his dying horse. And, and he went through the whole process of shifting his consciousness from his limited being, if you want to call it that, his personality, his person, to his his uh, to a greater sense of self, a more wide sense of self. And <clears throat> And when he did that shift, he could see himself as a young foal. And he could see how this young individual was, he was scared of everything. He was worried about the future. He was afraid of pain. He was afraid of humans. And he had this huge love towards himself as this tiny foal. So all he wanted to do was to tell him that, please, my, my dear boy, uh, you don't have to worry about anything. It's all fine. We're all going back to God. But then... Before he did that, he was like, no, wait a minute, I will not tell him because I trust him so much that he will be able to find this path by himself, that I will, I love him enough to trust him to go through all the pain and worries and sufferings that he will go through so we can finally meet here <laughs> because otherwise we would never have done that. And so there is this this love in setting someone free to also make all his all the mistakes he needs to make uh, and it was beautiful to follow him on this and and he survived he survived his injury he 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 healed after that he lived for another year and he had had a tumor after a year the tumor was so big that it was the end of it and i was sitting with him in this field next to a lake and i knew we both knew that he was dying in a few days and he was like this is fine i i've already done the the, the big death the big death that was a year ago. This step outside of existence, this is just, this is the small death, the small dying. And, and I'm thinking perhaps it is the same for us, that actually we are so tied to the habit of our identity that that's a bigger sense of dying than actually losing the body because, because, because of the repetition. Perhaps it is like that. And But what if we can start that journey already here? Yeah. Like then, you say, then, die before you die. Then, then we need compassion. So before we have that compassion as a, as a natural element in our human training, um, like I, we had a horse that described the human beings as not fully upright yet. It's like we are not completely there yet. Uh, and there is still hope, actually, also, because this is not all that we can be. But we need we need to to do something about it. Uh, we we need to have a will uh, to challenge ourselves. I suppose that's what I like with your questions. When you challenge me, I I I, I love this because it's there is such a a respect and curiosity in it, uh, and we need to do that to each other and and dare to do it because it's not criticism. It's 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 bringing out more of ourselves, right? Yeah. Um, so 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 I think. Sadly, nothing will happen for these pigs. Uh, perhaps not before before compassion has become a subject in school um, that is scheduled into our lives. Not something we do in the spare time when we have a nice moment and the sun is setting and the weather is good. It's it has to be part of our everyday practice. Very good. Um, yeah, there's several seed thoughts that I want to talk to you about in, in everything that you've just said. Um, one is how to make compassion more of a universal development for humanity. Mm -hmm. Another is um, on the subject of reincarnation. I have a question or two. And, another, and so have I. <laughs> yeah. That's very good. And another what? is about what you do there with your school. Because as you speak, I mean, you mentioned it's a school and a farm. And um, mm -hmm. as you speak, I, 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 I keep visioning that wow, this is a place where you should have like retreats where people can come for a week or two and, you know, 40, 50 people or whatever number you can accommodate and work with you, work with the animals and just kind of immerse themselves in yeah. the, the kind of um, wisdom you're expressing and and also just the your 
your orientation to animals. I think it could be a lot more beneficial for people than a lot, a great many spiritual retreats that people go on these <laughs> days. <laughs> so there's that. I mean, do you have anything like that when you say it's a school? Yeah, I mean, we've just, it took a long time. I mean, it's a process. Um and I don't know where it's going uh, because it started with the animals coming here in a very bad state and they needed time to heal and they needed a safe place. So my idea, I was 21 when I moved out here by myself with this crazy dream that no one believed in, perhaps not even me, but the urge to do it was stronger and I had nothing to lose, basically. Uh, to create a place where where you can be yourself without being judged, where you don't have to be someone else in order to be accepted, in order to survive, in order to make money. Uh, and and I, I wanted that for the animals, that they've been whipped, they've been uh, uh, threatened to be killed because they don't give people what they think that they deserve to get from these animals. We forget that if I buy a horse because I want to jump with that horse, for example, well, I buy that horse from another human being. I never made a deal with that horse. I mean, it's slave trade, actually. I mean, I, I buy, uh, I, I want a service from that animal and I pay someone else for it. And then I get disappointed when I don't get anything back from the animal to the point where I have these explanations that perhaps I should kill it um, because I deserve better. <laughs> it's very sad when you think about it like that. So I wanted to create a place where you can feel safe, uh, where you're not going to get sold. This is the end of, of the road. If you if you come here as as, as a as an animal that were close to die in a severe state of PTSD, most of them, then it's not that once you're once you're better, you will be sold. We take away the concept of being sold because it's it's problematic. It means that you have a limited value. And and animals tend to, even if you're worth $10 million, it's still very limited value because you can count it. And, and animals describes all species seem to describe that no matter what you are in this in this creation, the the life in you is equally big. There is not more life in you or me than in the tree or the elephant or the mosquito or the gnat or whatever. The the actual life there's it, it's unmeasurable, and there is a value in that that we need to be able to sense it in ourselves to really really value uh, th this creation, I guess. And and therefore, we can't have animals for sale because it would go against this idea. It would it would not only make the value of the animals smaller, but it would, it would reflect back on me because that's what I, how I would see them. Um, but all along, which I didn't know, was that the animals was also thinking that this is exactly the place that human needs. So exactly what you say is where they are going. Yeah. Because and they it, say that humans need to practice in. this too. It ties yeah. in with the idea of how can we develop more compassion? Because I think yeah. spending spending a week or two in a place like yours would definitely help to culture people's hearts and, and their compassion a lot more, which would yes, have a and, and it does value. Which is so hopeful that it, it, yeah. it seems to work. Yeah. I mean, you have to come by free will and you have to accept the full fact that you have to do the job yourself. You're not going to be given anything. Uh, that needs to be clear because otherwise we are waiting to be fed with wisdom and then we will come out in the other end as more wise people. We, we need to take it in and it's our own responsibility. The horses are there whether we can go to where they are that's our responsibility we need to follow the urge but it seems to really work so we were i was creating this place for the animals and the animals seems to all along be creating it for us yeah um uh, because they say that since we have developed this this gap uh, we have this gap. I mean, I guess in the end it's a gift, uh, but without the connection to the entirety, it's, it's problematic. Like you say, we are teenagers. We really are. Um, but because we then all the time interpret the world, then we believe that that's what everyone is doing to us too. So if I'm creating a world based on opinions, I believe that everyone else is doing it too, whether I think it or not, which means that as a human being, I probably have an underlying fear of being judged all the time to some extent, <clears throat> which means that I also have a protection against that. And that protection is in the way in the development of compassion. 
that's going to be problematic. So in order to start practicing compassion, I cannot feel judged. I think if we copy what might be happening on the other side, is that we go to a place where we are not being judged when we are met with full compassion. And perhaps that's the only thing that can make us see ourselves fully. Then that what naturally that would be what we need to create here. And, and, and we need a place that it's safe enough for nature to create at least what we can with our resources, a natural environment. Where, where life can interact with each other. It would be different if we are cutting down the forests around. We don't own almost anything. The farm where I live is tiny. So we, we are renting land all over the place. Uh, so all the animals can can have place. And now we have a situation where land is being sold. It's complicated. And we're now trying to think that, okay, to make this place last, because now we are in a transition step, to make this place last, perhaps... In, 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 a, in a legal form, we need to create a foundation. Because if we create a foundation, it means that, that legally the land will actually then own itself. And if the land own itself, then we are moving closer to an equal meeting between human beings and other species. And then we are one step closer to compassion. And also it needs to pass, it has to, to get past me. Uh, I can't be in the middle of this. That's not the idea. Even if I started it, it's, it shouldn't be owned by me and die with me. It needs to, uh, to have its own landing and, and, and sitting in the, in this world. In, in, uh, we're hoping for that. So, so that's a project that is ha happening now because exactly what you say, uh, we had a horse dying. Uh, naturally they die, they live here all their lives and, and, and they die. Uh, and it's sad, of course, but it's, there is also a beauty in it. And, and the last thing he saw before he died is similar to what you said. In, in, in the forest line uh, at the end of the field where he was standing, he saw rows of people waiting and they wanted to come in. And he said that when people are really longing in their hearts to experience this, uh, you are meant to welcome them. You don't turn them away. Um, and I think that and that is really important. Um, and we're looking for forms for that because this is so new. The school started in 2018 and uh, it's it's we have now now we're on our third class and it's 30 students and they are chosen by the horses. Uh, so they have to send a letter in to me uh, because I need something that is them. <laughs> And then what, you read the letter to the horses? <laughs> yes, I read the letter to the horses. Uh, I, I don't think they are at all interested in the content. It's right. like, I've done this, this is but my name. They get an image of the person when you... They get an image of the person. Uh, and, and it's fascinating because they don't seem to choose the people because you are chosen and you are better than this one and you have this ability. They seem to choose them because something in that person is being seen. I remember one horse explaining that I was reading a letter and she saw a pair of hands and she said, who would only show the hands? That's interesting. And because that connection had happened by the curiosity of the horse, that person was then welcomed. And, and it seems to be that they mainly invite people because of the timing of things, not because of who you are and what you're good at, because there's never an explanation. Uh, it only seems to be that the timing is... At this moment, our paths are crossing, so you can come. What and, percentage of people who apply can come? Well, we have, for the last class, we had about 200 people applying, all in all, and, and there's place for 30. Wow, interesting. Uh, oh. and, and I'm thinking that the longing uh, with, inside of the people that cannot come all at the same time, because I also we we need to be able to fo we, we cannot commercialize this. It wouldn't work. Right. Uh, it has to be. Can't yes, be you, you pay. You, you pay. Of, of yeah. Animal. animal. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you pay. You pay a fee because we have to pay our taxes and all. Oh, of that. sure. Yeah, people but, should pay. Yeah. Yeah, but it's the the point is not that. I mean, that's what we need to do. Right. Uh, but but why we have to limit the numbers is also because of time and space. You yeah, want to have yeah. time to meet these people. What if a thousand, After, what if people watch this interview and a thousand people want to come? You're going to have yeah. to limit yeah. the numbers. So, so, and, and after one year, the ground course, the, the, the sort of basic course yeah. uh, is, is two years and we meet in weekends uh, and we're outside all the time because the horses are outside all the time. And I think 
it's important that it's not too comfortable. I don't mean it as it has to be uncomfortable, but I think we need to feel things. We need to experience it with the bodies. Yeah. If it's rain, we're outside and we feel the rain. Sometimes we're cold. Sometimes we don't understand anything. Sometimes we're frustrated. That's important. The, the fascinating thing when you take a group in like this is that normally in school, you know, you learn things and you prove to your teacher that you've learned it. Here, you seem to get exercises from the mainly the horses, and you're not actually supposed to be able to, to succeed all the time. Because if you succeed all the time, you're actually creating an identity around being a successful student. So in, in some exercises, you get a glimpse. In some exercises, you see what is between you and the meeting point with the other one. In some exercises, nothing happens at all because your presence is holding the space for perhaps that one student that is getting a glimpse in that exercise. So th this cannot be, you cannot be a successful student in this concept. But after one year, you get a mentor horse. After that first year, the horses have observed you. And, and, and sometime during that year, you would have, perhaps only for a second, but some connection would have happened that makes one horse feel particularly responsible for you. And at the end of the year, you get that horse will explain something to me about that person that I write down as a letter. So in the winter, because because of the weather, it's cold in the winter. So the course is from April to November. Uh, in December, it would be the, the lack of comfort would be too obvious, right? Uh, and then the horse that becomes your mentor will give you personal exercises until we meet again in the spring. Um, and And to me... That is so private that when I write it down, I feel that I shouldn't read it. So I never read it twice. I just try to get it down and, and put it away because it's not for me. right? And um, so it's two years like this. They meet eight times and they have these studies in the winter. And then after the first two years, the, lots of the students didn't want to finish. They wanted to come back. And I thought, well, there is nothing saying that they can't come back. So we have some students doing follow follow-up years uh, so some did five years so every second year we start a new class uh, because to go that deep and to be able to write these letters if it's a hundred I wouldn't be able to do it um, but we're also I think this has to happen in the physical but there are things that we can share online so we're creating a platform for stories um I mean I mean the pandemic taught us a lot about how we can share things when we can't meet and some of that is valuable right uh, so we can have a platform where people can take part of what we're doing here and start practicing at home even if you have to wait for your place to come into one of the courses uh, let me and, ask you a couple of questions here um I imagine there's a lot with all you're saying, it sounds like there's a lot you can teach people, but can you actually help them to acquire the kind of ability to, that you have to? Yes. Uh, so how many people, what percentage again, or talking percentages are able to <laughs> achieve some degree of, of most, most animal definitely. communication the way you do it? I would say all of them to some extent, but very individually. It's like, for me, it will happen a lot through vision and uh, because I would see images and I would get feelings and instant experiences. Before I did this, I, I, I ran away from home when I was very young because it was complicated. And I I earned my living as, as painting portraits. So I, th I think for me, it would naturally come as images because that's that's the fastest way probably for my brain to perceive something. It wouldn't necessarily be an image for someone else, but it can still be a very deep experience of the other one. And, and I would say that that has happened to all of the students uh, in, in, in different ways, in different degrees. But the, the really hopeful thing is it's, it's, it's possible. It's not, something, it's not something that you teach as a method, but by placing a person in an environment that is non-judgmental and, and somehow safe, uh, and we practice a, a compassionate being, uh, a compassionate interaction, like in lots of exercises, someone will be with the horse. I mean, for example, we can have 
a person sitting on a horse with closed eyes and, and no bridle and saddle, you're completely vulnerable. And we have another person just holding that space that can foresee if something happens, that is protecting this in a way. Uh, we need to practice holding that space for each other. The one holding the space is as important as the one doing the exercise for that to take place. So it seems to be more about the space that we are upholding. It's not really a technique, but it's re-entering that space seems to be what, what does it. Uh, the exercises... Uh, are probably just designed differently to fit different people from different angles. Um, that's what, why there is a variety. The real exercise seems to be around one question or two, which is from me to the horse, who are you? Who are you? Or who are, who are you? Uh, the, the, the longing to, to meet the world. And then the question, who am I? Uh, which we will never be able to answer, but it doesn't make it less relevant. I've seen a number of TV shows um, about prisoners who are allowed to work with horses or dogs, or even sometimes I think there was one where they were able to have pet cats. And, and um, it was tremendously, it was a wonderful service for the animals, but it was extremely rehabilitative for the prisoners. So we were talking earlier about, you know, criminal rehabilitation. It'd be cool if if your thing could be systematized in a way that, to be introduced more widely in that context um I, I think it could eventually because if it starts to i mean it's obviously lives its own life and it's it's <laughs> when right. you start practice this thing starts to happen and it's like you said this is where we are now we have this this course and we have a children's group that, that came today uh, they were practicing lying down on horses that are loose in a herd so that their spine is following the horse spine until they are just floating in, in the sort of similar experience of bodies. It seems to go through the body really helps. Yeah. Um, and then we have a horse that started a hoof school uh, in, in how to how to trim the horse's feet in connect like, like what, what would. When we take away the relationship between the horse and the ground, we have to replace that somehow. And we replace it technologically. But what if we go in in a compassionate way and experience this, this relationship between the hoof and the ground and become part of that? And that's for farriers because it's so detailed. So you need to have some basic knowledge before. A farrier and, is somebody who trims horses who... Yes, exactly. Right. Uh, and then we have now just recently started a course with a horse that is helping to plan the grazing. Where In which fields should we move the horses in which time of the year? Uh, and, and, and what if, because, because we lock them in, right? We lock them in pens and, and we have harvested the grass. We have disturbed all the functions <laughs> underneath the ground. So it's a hard job for her, but she's teaching us about it. Uh, uh, and, and we get to follow her. We're going to meet her six times this year, six times, and, and, and follow her connection with the ground and how a grazing animal uh, is not only how they eat, but also how they move and how they, they trample on the ground that makes a difference for the grass and how it grows. Um, and I guess it's like what, what we find here and what kind of concepts, I mean, if, if people would come from far away, it wouldn't have, it would be complicated with a weekend. Maybe then we would need, like you say, like a retreat for a week that is more intense, for example. Uh, I don't think there is a limited form. The form will develop as we try it out because, because we don't have, um, we are not in, in, I mean, we're not we're not a university. We we don't have a form that we need to. And there's no structure. We are creating the structure. We are outside. Our classroom is outside. I wouldn't uh, be surprised if after this interview, people want to come from all over the world. Yeah, um, yeah and and if if they do, I'd, I'd if like anyone does, <laughs> yes, yeah, you're come welcome. A, I'll come and shovel <laughs> manure. I don't care. Yes, <laughs> I did that once with cows for a few months. <laughs> and, and what you say about shoveling manure is is actually also interesting because. In order to receive something, we must give something. 
and and we we make that trade and as we know we need to pay bills i mean you you, uh, you, you also get paid for what you do and that, that, that's that's one system that we have but then we have the system of giving without thinking about what we will get back and that part needs to be there too so so i mean we we run this as as a welfare uh, as a sanctuary uh, because the animals have no obligation to contribute with anything and we don't sell them so we don't get any money from them and, and that's a sanctuary you pay for the teachings uh, because that's how we can pay the bills and and, and do it all legally correct um, and we have students that also do what you say they come and and, and they shovel manure uh, we also work with the theater school a physical theater school and 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 they we did a project where they come and and clean the barn uh, for a couple of hours and after that they get an exercise from any one of the species in how to in how they can find different aspects of their bodies that can be used in their artwork uh, and that's one of the most fascinating things i've ever done because it's something about giving of your time and your effort and it will help in in what you will gain back you can't do it in order to gain something uh, but there is something in that giving and one of the horses that was really teaching us this he also said that it's part of your fee uh, what you what you what you take it has to be a gift so i will always give a bit more than what people pay for and 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 people will always give uh, a bit more <laughs> uh, as well but it could it could be in any kind of way you can bring coffee, you can help cleaning, you can, but we need that, we need to feel that none of us are, it's not just a trade, it, it, we're also meeting because we really want to meet as equals, as yeah. people. Let me ask you that question about reincarnation. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Let's some, just fit in reincarnation so we, we yeah. sort that out too. Someone it's then, very fascinating. Someone named Petra Miskoff, Miskoff <laughs> in London asked, do animals say there is reincarnation, that we, they are reborn? And before you answer her question, I just want to add one. Have you ever met um, animals or horses who had been human beings and are now horses or have you met human beings who had been horses and are now human beings well whether things can be proven or not has to be, has right. to well, now let, be. let's say a, let's say a horse <clears throat> tells you yeah i was joe yep. schmo i lived in london in my last life and now i'm here as yep. a horse <laughs> there is a difference uh there is a difference when when we talk about reincarnation with humans we seem to always have some sort of scale where you become a human in the end and then you re you stay a human it's like if you've been a human you don't go back animals i would say talk a lot about reincarnation but there are two different things there that i don't hear as much from humans one is and that's complex um how private is reincarnation if if we follow the road to to this forgetfulness where everything is merging into one and out of that we are reborn how can i know for sure that it's it's just my soul and nothing yeah. else <laughs> well, the buddhists seem to have this idea that you know you just scoop a bucket into the ocean of karma and mm. come out and there's a new life for you which may yeah. be a conglomerate of many people's karma as yeah. i understand it i might be misrepresenting that and the hindus have more of an idea it seems that our individual jiva or soul remains discreet and moves from life to life and evolves as it goes along yeah. and accumulates experience and perhaps both of those can be true without contradicting each other Perhaps. if 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 you're not too linear um i had this this beautiful it, it needs to just be put in here uh we had sometimes in the in the in the classes a horses uh, we can ask questions to a particular horse that is interested in a subject and there was this questioning with 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 an elderly mare and somehow the questions led up to her speaking about prayer and you think that is that is purely human but it seems like praying is a natural state for pretty much everyone on this planet and, and she described prayer and th this will lead to reincarnation uh, she she conveyed an image of something that looked like what the soul was made of like the matter of souls <laughs> uh, and on that big sort of light kind of mat i would describe it like that like a carpet sort of thing uh, there were little little circular like oval things that were drawn and she said they're only drawn there these are the individual souls they are not cut out 
uh, they are just drawn. So you can see them. This is the individual, but it's not taken out. It's not separate. So we are individual, but we are never disconnected, would be. And to her, the meaning of prey would sure, like, be... Just like waves. They're individual waves, yeah. but they're not disconnected from the... Yes, ex- exactly. And and the, for her, the meaning of praying would be to remind yourself about that. You wouldn't pray to get something, but the prayer would lead you back to the memory that we are not disconnected, and, and that would bring a sense of hope. That's nice. And it is really, it's really beautiful, and it makes a lot of sense, I think. So... So, uh, like what you say, the scooping thing, like like funny, a horse that seemed to relate to reincarnation all the time, and she helps people by seeing those stories, say that we cannot really say which story belongs to whom, because because but we can say that some stories have affected you, and 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 really affected t- to in who you are now more than other stories, but. To whom the story belonged is perhaps le- res- less relevant. It affects you, and that's what counts. Um, and she also had uh, one woman saying, "What if? What if life is too difficult? What do you do when life is too difficult?" And she said, "Well, if if your life is overwhelming and it's too difficult, then others will come and help you." Meaning that what she basically said is like, "Your karma is not only yours. You might be helping someone else in their karma. Someone else might be helping you. Karma is not personal. It's something we do together." And I, and I, I like that thought as well. But the same horse also say that when you leave this life, you go out through. It's like she sent an, an, an image of a little, um, like a little gate. Like a little door, you go out there. When you enter again, you go in through the same door. Because you go in through the same door, you actually also bring on like your old clothes. So even if you're everyone and everyone is in you, you also follow a personal story. And if if you go through all of this in a couple of minutes, perhaps both are true. We are being scooped up as a mixture, but there is also a personal story. But the, in the personal story, we are never disconnected and we're continuously helping each other. So that's one thing that comes from animals. And the other thing is that they seem to never really make any scales of anything. It's like whether you become a human being, a stone, a tree, a water. <laughs> I mean, you can be an element. Uh, it doesn't really seem to matter. It's like you will enter this life and get exactly the experience that you precisely need because life seemed to really wish us the best it's like there is something kind behind all this we get exactly what is best for us we just don't understand it and and this circular thing uh, it seems to just be circles moving in all directions rather than a ladder and eventually you end up with god it's like you you are never disconnected from god uh, so you, you just keep going in and out uh, and 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 perhaps so so then what you do and what you give in this life is much more important than who you are, in a way. Hmm. So, so they all seem to they all seem to relate to reincarnation, but not in not as a ladder to reach a goal. Yeah, interesting. Um, I guess what you give is the proof of who you are. You know, it's the yeah, it's the it's the. It's, it's the walking of the talk, <laughs> so yeah. to speak. Um, here's a, a cute little bit from your book. All, among all the animals I have been communicating with, there's one question that they repeatedly continue to ask. How is it that you people have forgotten where you once came from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's th- that's the entire story, right? Yeah, it is. So there's a lot <laughs> of interesting stuff in your book that we haven't had a chance to get to. I mean, there's... You're, you had some amazing experiences in New Zealand, which were, you know, far yes. out. I mean, interesting yes. stuff. Um, you have had some amazing experiences in Jordan. Um, oh, definitely. And, you know, there's this fellow Muhammad who somehow or other you actually just sort of merge consciousnesses with at some yes. point. And, and he was treating horses through you and you were treating horses through him. And that was all very interesting. And then there's the whole time travel thing where you, you f- keep flashing back to this time where there's a green yes. man and a young girl and 
and all this stuff. And we don't really have time to talk about all this stuff right now. You once saw the king of Iraq as an apparition, not the current king of Iraq, but some yeah. ancient king of Iraq yes. who actually showed up in the stable with you and was conversing with you. And and then I thought um, I'd really lost it until yeah. I, I and I went back to see my... Uh, the, I, I can say that I work for her, but she's also my great friend. So I don't know what to call it. She is my friend. Um, but everything seems to be normal to her. So when I come back from the stables and she's related to this person. She was like the I daughter this, of the king of, her, of King Hussein uh, uh, or something. Yeah, yes, saying? exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and I said, oh, I saw this person at the stables and he told me these things. And I'm, now I've really lost it and I don't know what to do. And she's like, what did he look like? And I described him and his essence and the way he looks. And she brings out a photo and she says, is it him? Yes. Well, that's normal, you know, because he used to be king <laughs> in Iraq and some yeah. of the horses here are relatives to the horses he had. And and to her, um, th this linear that we come and go and that we keep connecting beyond time, it's it's everyday life for her. It's very uh, interesting. Yeah. And it's yeah. everyday life for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I struggle a bit more than her. That's the only thing. Yeah. <laughs> So here's a good quote that maybe we should wrap it up on. You can comment on it if you want. Um, but, you know, I, I can talk to you for another two hours about all these things, but maybe we'll do another one one of these days and cover some of the things we didn't <laughs> we talk can. about today. I mean, you're yeah. always welcome here anyway. Oh, so. thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun to, I mean, it's a lot easier to do a Zoom call than it is to fly to Sweden. We can, st it, we can start yeah, like that. It's fun to do that too. But here's a little something, that an end note, which you can comment. Oh, the, I mean, here's another thing you said in the... In the <laughs> in the book that I thought would be interesting to talk about that we didn't get to, which is that there were situations in your life where trees nearby were being clear cut and yeah. you ended up having like a visceral reaction to it in terms of your kidneys failing and your heart having problems and stuff like that. Um, which is like, you were kind of in training with the soul of the trees that were being yeah. killed, you know, interesting. Um, all right, so here's this point uh, that we could that could perhaps be a wrap up point. So I'll try to pronounce this Arabic word, but Alhamdulillah. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. Yeah. yeah. Whatever happens, it must be for the best of everything. I may not be able to see it at the time, but I have faith in the way things are. Yeah. That's a good thing to live by. Yeah, it is. I try to do that. Whatever yeah. God does is for the best is another way of putting mm. it. Yeah. Yeah. So um are you in is your place in pretty good shape are you in dire circumstances now of losing the thing because you don't have enough money what's going on there Yeah we we're both um we we are losing a farm that has been the center point of the educational part because it's the best grazing paddock for the horses it's huge and that's for up for sale and they want us to buy it and we don't have enough money Uh-huh so, so announcement people if you would yeah. like to contribute to, to yeah, Emily. that would be very helpful because yeah. and if on it was website, only, I'm sure there's something about how to contribute. Yeah, there is. And if it was only that, it would be easier. But then we're losing another huge paddock because of a solar cell park, and we're we're losing three more paddocks because they're being replanted with trees instead of keep kept as grazing lands. Right. So when we lost all these, you come to the question: Well, is this a sign that we should just stop what we're doing? It's like, but there are no other signs of that. And the horses are not saying that. So what if this is that we need to reach out to the world and say that we need help? Yeah. Uh, is this important enough for enough people? Then if we can collect, the horses always said that this place is being kept and held by many small good deeds. So if we can collect more small good deeds, uh, that will then be turned into this foundation. A foundation can only be built around something that is physical and exists. So the idea is, if we can get enough money to buy this particular farm that is for sale, we will turn that into a foundation. Mm -hmm. So that, if, that farm would would meet your needs in terms of space yes, and all that yes, stuff. Yes, it would. And then we would turn it into a foundation. And it means that we can receive and welcome more people because we will have a more solid ground, literally. Uh, if we can't uh, achieve that, then we will have to trust. It's like you say, we will have to trust that God wishes as well. And there is another, we're not going to give up. Uh, then we will continue to, to collect things until we can buy something else. Uh, because I truly believe in, in this foundation. 
to create this, this non-judgmental space that will continue past us that live now. And so so any we we have information about it in the website and anyone that contributes anything, it, it goes only to that. It will not, there is no administration fees, there's nothing. It definitely will either uh, be this farm or or something else that, that will show itself to be the one. Uh, and because- uh, do you know the story of the old man and the boy walking on the beach and, and seeing a lot of starfish? Do you know that story? No. Okay, so this relates to what you're, you're, you're talking about here. So an old man and a boy were walking along a beach, and the tide had gone out. And there were just thousands of starfish, as far as the eye could see, that were lying on the shore and drying up in the sun. And, you know, they're all going to die if they didn't get back in the water, but they couldn't get back in the water. So as they walked along, every, uh, uh, I mean, could you? you just can't, yeah. All right. Anyway, we'll just let the dog cough in the background. doesn't yeah. matter. <laughs> no, it's a dog. It's yeah. <laughs> one of us. Um, so anyway, as they walked along, the, every now, every few steps, the old man would bend down, pick up a starfish and throw it in the water. And and after a while, the boy said to him, you know, why, why bother? You know, what difference can it possibly make? There are thousands of them. What, you know, what, how, what difference can you make? And he, so uh, when the boy said that the man reaches down, picks up another one, throws it in the water and says, made a difference to that one. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. your, your place, I mean, yeah. people might think, okay, there are millions of animals in the world. There are 22 million pigs in Iowa. There are all this stuff. What, what, what can your little farm with 150 animals do? But I, I think it not only makes a difference to that to the, the animals that you actually treat or help, but it something like that is a, is like a a beacon or a, a, a transmitter that um, that creates a quality in collective consciousness that is sorely needed in the world, and that may in fact be. Um, multiplied if if your transmitter is bright enough or strong enough or whatever so that, such that more more things will like that will crop up and collective consciousness it will change and you know will help to sort of bring about the transformation that we were talking about earlier of to what society actually needs to be if it's if it's to survive and flourish exactly and and that's a lot. If we get a chance to talk again, that's what the Jordanian horses are really speaking about. The the connection between the transformation of the individual and, and how that affects society and how that cannot be taken apart from each other. So so I guess it it counts. It's like every every glimpse counts, every every intention counts in a way. Yeah, yeah. It- they say that there are yogis in the Himalayas who just live in a cave, but they radiate an influence without which the the humanity would be much worse off. And you know, I kind of, I kind of, I truly this, believe that. Yeah, something like what you're doing, I see as this, in a similar way. It, it creates an influence that is sorely needed, and that um, it really helps the world in in a much bigger way than than you might um, than people might realize is possible. Mm. A couple of more questions came in. Might as well ask them. They're kind of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> kind of goofy, um, but um, and a little out of context with this grand conclusion we just reached, but what the heck. Um, so <laughs> here's one from um, a, a fellow named Srinath in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm sure your answer to this is yes. Can you converse with cows uh, as you can yes. with horses? Yes. Yeah. They probably speak a different language, but you can converse. <laughs> No, it's like everything that is alive. If everything that is alive knows that it's alive, there is always a meeting point. Yeah, I mean, you have several stories in the book of communicating with trees, and trees; those trees had a lot of interesting things to say. Now, here's one from Sri Ram Ganesh in Chennai, India. Um, when you say not, when you say not all all eggs are meant to be chicken, certain eggs are meant to be eaten. Who decides it, the egg or the eater? Will not this concept of um, of that things are meant to be eaten justify anything? Like, like he's that is a, saying, that is a know, very good question. Decides, I mean, the, does the pig decide mm, he wants to be mm, food instead of live his life as a pig? Mm, yeah, this is uh, we need more time that's for yeah. sure. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, it's right. I wouldn't say yeah. When you use the phrase "meant to be," it's complicated. I, I think what the chicken meant is that not every egg will be a chicken. Some eggs will be food. Who decides what is how much is free will? And how much how much of our actions is guarded because of what we choose and how much can we choose and how much of our actions is because we are unconsciously acting on the greater good. 
we wouldn't know that, would we? No. Okay. And how much does our awakening change? I guess, I mean, the horse that are teaching us this, one of the horses that really made the basis of this school, it's like, so what is, where are we going with this then? Well, one of the things is freedom, not freedom to do whatever we want, but freedom to truly choose because we are not so tied to our identifications. So we are not just pulled by forces. Right. Um, Have more discern we'll, we'll, discernment uh, or discrimination. Yes. And how much will that choice change the entirety and the ability for others to do that? I mean, all of that is in that question about the egg, right? Yeah, it's interesting. Huh. Wow. <laughs> Already. So, wow, this has been great, Emily. I really enjoyed this. Um, Thank I liked, you. I liked your book, and I like talking to you even more than your book. Um, <laughs> so, so thanks so <laughs> Thank much. You. And, and thanks for what you're doing, and, and thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Um, and... Um, you know, I'll obviously have a page up on BatGap with a little bit more about Emily and links to her books and links to her website and so on, so that you can go there. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting things to read on the website. And, um, and you know, hopefully people listening to this will contribute to you financially. Some may want to come for courses. And, you know, I just really hope it helps to um, boost everything you're doing, because I think what you're doing is really important and beautiful. And, the, and and hopefully just the inspiration that might come or or just challenging the thoughts to something that wasn't before. Um, and, and we're constantly changing. I mean, the website is changing. So much is happening now. Right. And, and, and forms of meeting and teaching. Um, it's definitely, uh, it, it feel, that part feels very hopeful. That, that's why I believe it's, we're not meant to shut down. We're meant to find the next level of, of ground just also in this case it, it's the ground literally you know <laughs> i was reminded again of, of my teacher who was marishi mahesh yogi by the way um and very early in his mission he was sitting uh, in um some redwood forest in california with a small group of people and he was the only teacher at that point of of transcendental meditation and um, he was talking about these big plans of get every, getting everybody in the world to meditate, or lots of people. And, and someone said, "Well, how in the world can you do that? You're just <laughs> you're just one man." And he said, "I'll replicate myself." Yeah. <laughs> so yes. I hope that I hope that what you're doing can actually <laughs> result in people establishing things similar to yours. Yes, yes, you know, and it is, that is happening. It it's, it starts to happen actually. So it's uh, it is it is hopeful. It's. Lots of work to do, but it's also hopeful. Yeah. <clears throat> Great. Okay. Well, thank you. And um, my next interview will be towards the end of the month. And I'm going to be teach talking with two people that I've interviewed previously, but on different topics. The topic of this one is going to be about what's going on with extraterrestrials. Are they really visiting us? And we're not going to spend too much on that. We're going to kind of jump to the conclusion that they are, but then we're going to get into a why. What, does it have some kind of spiritual significance? And uh, I th I think it's going to be an interesting conversation, I think, um, for, for me at least. So that's why I'm doing it. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, hope you'll join us for that. And there's an upcoming interviews page on batgap.com where you can see such, you know, what we've got scheduled coming up. All right. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. We'll be in touch. We will. Yes. <laughs> and thanks to those who've been listening or watching. We'll, we'll see you around. Bye-bye. Bye.